Hi, I'm Cher Safran with Share Wisdom Network and host of the Nautilus Book Awards Author Spotlight Series. Now celebrating 20 years of honoring better books for a better world, Nautilus Book Awards continues this important mission forward to spotlight visionary books that co-create a better world and more positive future. The Nautilus Awards embraces books from a wide spectrum of the publishing industry, which radiate hope and wisdom, inspiring and connecting our lives as individuals, communities, and planetary citizens. This is a vast and crucial conversation now more than ever. The Author Spotlight series offers opportunity to increase the volume and visibility of the author's voices as found in these empowering Nautilus Award-winning books. Author Dr. Gail Gross is with us here today, sharing insights from her Nautilus Award-winning book, How to Build Your Baby's Brain, a parent's guide to using new gene science to raise a smart, secure, and successful child which won the Silver Award in the Parenting category. So I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Gross. Dr. Gail Gross is a nationally recognized family, child, development, and human behavior expert, author, and lecturer who's frequently called upon by national and regional media to offer her insight on topics involving family relationships, education behavior, and development issues. Dr. Gross has contributed to dozens of national and international network broadcasts, print and online media, including her talk show on PBS and her radio show, both called Let's Talk with Dr. Gross. She has earned accolades from distinguished leaders such as the Dalai Lama, who presented her with the first Spirit of Freedom Award in 1998 and Houston Women's Magazine named her one of Houston's most influential women of 2016. In addition to receiving the Nautilus Silver Award, How to Build Your Baby's Brain received the National Parenting Product Award and was ranked as the number one best new parenting book in 2019. And this year, How to Build Your Baby's Brain was a Next Generation Indie Book Awards winner and was named Top Parenting Book to Read in 2020 by Book Authority. Wow! Dr. Gail Gross, I am so happy to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Cher. It's lovely to be here, really. Well, congratulations on all the awards and congratulations on your Nautilus Book Award. I am just really delighted to be able to talk to you about this book. And frankly, I wish your book were in the hands of every parent, regardless mm -hmm. of the age of the child, including those of us who have adult children. I found it absolutely captivating, and I saw how I could have done things differently and how I can still do things differently now. So thank you for writing this book. <laughs> Oh, that's my pleasure. Thank you for re recognizing it. That means a lot to me. Well, and as I was researching and as I was writing it, I was thinking, I wish I had known this when I was raising my children. So, I do too. <laughs> but you're helping generations beyond. So thank you for that. And I thought it would be a good way to begin our conversation. If you would just read an excerpt from your book, I think it'll set the stage really beautifully. This is from the introduction. You are well aware that your child's future prospects hinge upon her academic performance. You're inundated on all sides by frenzy statistics, scores, and scholastic stress. And it's all starting earlier and earlier. Our curriculum-obsessed culture has convinced you that to raise a successful, high-achieving child, we need to outsource her education to those who are more qualified with those who stand to benefit doing most of the convincing. You may even believe that scientific advances and new technologies in education and learning can make your child smarter, provided you can secure a spot for her in just the right program. However, contrary to what you've been taught, you don't need talking heads or a host of expensive programs and toys. The truth is you're wasting money and time on programs that put the cart before the developmental horse, 
ultimately keeping your child from where she needs to go. After reading this book, you will have a firm grasp of everything it takes to raise a happy, high-achieving, confident, empathic, and successful child. This book could not come at a more crucial time in our culture. Our children face a more threatening world than many of us remember from our childhoods. Far too many have been hurried to grow up too fast, resulting in an epidemic of stress, mental illness, physical ailments, violence, and emotional and mental shutdown. You as a parent want what's best for your child because you love her. I believe your job has never been more important, not only for your child's future, but for ours. We need more children who dare to break from the group and chase the questions that intrigue them. We need that next generation to be grounded in the empathy and connection bred from the security you provide. Most of all, we can't survive without a new generation of fearless innovators and leaders. This book will not only teach you how to provide a happy, brilliant, and successful future for your child, it will help you secure the contribution to our collective success. So beautiful, so powerful, and just like you said, so needed. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for that. Now, one of the things, uh, themes in your book is the need for bonding. And, you know, we've talked about bonding for generations, but I'm not sure I really know what that means. So if you can explain, what do you mean by bonding and why is that so important? You know, we're a primate and all primates are, have with an, a feeling for attachment. And we think of a baby in utero is absolutely, you know, just like a little uh, pea pod out in, in the garden. But actually, from four months on, that little baby is learning our language. It's interacting with our, our outer world, with the sounds in our outer world, our laughter, our reading a book to them. They're actually coming along with us, and in a sense, socializing and culturizing while they're in utero. If there are twins in utero, they immediately connect to each other. If they're fraternal twin, twins, they'll push their little sacks close together so that one cheek can rest on the other cheek of the second twin. They even fight in utero if there are twins. So we know that right away, attachment is part of who we are as a species. We're a social species. We learn socially, in fact. Um, Albert Bandura's very famous uh, uh, book on social learning is all about this. And so when we have our baby in the West, we immediately separate from our baby. We take them home from the hospital. If we're lucky enough to have a hospital that keeps that baby in the room with us, that's a good thing. But typically, they keep baby in a nursery, separate from us. So imagine, for nine months, our little baby has been with us, in our tummy, in our womb, and getting used to only us and everything that we are experiencing in our outer, outer world that they have a figuratively, a small but definite experience with. So that little person is now taken away from us, either put in a nursery, or when we get home, we put them in a nursery instead of keeping them in our room. Well, that little baby who has no sense of time or space is terrified. And the inoculation against this kind of stress is the bonding with mother and father, but primarily the first person that baby is connected to because she was mother's roommate for nine months is mother. So whatever we can do to keep baby's stress down, to comfort baby, to, um, I used to make recordings of my voice when my children were little. And I would play those recordings whenever I wasn't around. And I would tell a story. I'd say their prayers. And I, when they were in the crib, I would 
play a recording of my voice to calm them and make them feel I was there. If I had to be away, I would put up a picture so they could see me, they could hear my voice, so they were not fearful of being abandoned. When I was working, I would call and check in. And these are the things that you can do to compensate for time away. So attached and bonding is the, if you had one essential thing to do for your child, only one, it would be bond. Bond with your child. Remind your child of your smell, that smell they're so familiar with the sound of your voice. And whenever po possible, keep baby with you. You know, other cultures understand this. The West is very far behind. We became very clinical too fast. If you look at other babies in other cultures, the mother just slings baby on her shoulder, across her breast, or on her back, and she carries on with her day. Baby is bonded. He's hearing her voice, which is helping his language, and he's being socialized with her social interactions. And so these babies develop to their fuller potential. And not only that, they're not stressed. They sleep better, they eat better, and they, are, they handle problem solving better. Because we know anxiety is one of the biggest problems that children face when they go to school, for example. You've all heard of test anxiety. Well, this can be inoculated against with a well-bonded child that builds a strong central core. Wow, wow. What I, what I love, Dr. Gross, is I had three other questions. You answered <laughs> all three. <laughs> you, I mean, they're all related, right? Even if I was gonna ask you, you know, what do you do when a child is feeling stressed? And you actually have a, a Wonder, you don't just address babies, you address older children as well. And so I just, that initial bonding is so critical, but also you have techniques. So maybe we didn't do quite as well with that if first, or the child is adopted. And so there is that separation that needs to be overcome in those. But really your book just covers the gamut and even in that descri description of bonding, you covered so much ground that's so precious and so important and you give really practical guidance for parents. Um, I could just spend all day talking with you about this, but what would you? what is the one message that you hope parents and grandparents and people who care about children will take away from this book? There are two things that we know today that affect IQ. One, as you might, you already know, is the well-bonded child. The child whose cortisol is kept in balance because cortisol is important to us for function, but it's the overproduction of cortisol that is injurious to the developing brain. That's number one. And the other is talking. Talk, 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 talk. And not in baby sentences, and not in parentese, and not in any of these things, but in, in declarative st sentences, real sentences. You know, when we put a child with a babysitter, or in a nursery, or even with a nanny, they have a different agenda than you would have with your child. Your agenda is, in a nursery, they have 10 other children. And so they're trying to keep everyone quiet and happy. So they're not using complicated language with your child. A nanny or a babysitter, the same thing. It behooves them to have a happy, docile, quiet child. But you as a mother or you as a father recognize the importance of being there with your child so that you can recognize deficits and immediately take care of those, or so that you can help your child with language. Because language that's complicated builds in the brain something we call an associative mass. The more I talk, the more words I hear, the more associations I make. Imagine that a child learns a 
foreign language in about two years without ever opening a book, without ever being instructed, without ever learning grammar. Simply, at, at, this is Patricia Cole's work um, and, uh, in Seattle. But she tells us that in, in, uh, from four months on, baby is learning mother's language in particular. So that when baby's born, if we put electrodes on baby's head and he hears 20 different languages from 20 different mothers, but if he hears mother's language, part of the brain will light up. Now, if he hears mother's voice speaking mother's language, his whole brain lights up like an orchestra. And so we know that when a child is talked to, that they are recognizing language because they already have it from four months in utero. And so it's building, building, building. And the more we build on language, the more impact it has on IQ. In fact, there are some studies that actually say you can raise an IQ by 20 points. And one definite is language, complicated language, and the other is bonding. And Complicated language is not, as I said, any of these baby talk kinds of approaches. No. What we want to do is declarative sentences. Instead of saying um, the silly things that we say, you know, there's many cute movies where parents are standing at that, that window and the nursery is saying goo goo gaga and the baby's saying, I hope that's not my parent. And, but rather, if we say, come on, sweetheart, it's time for dinner. Let's wash your hands and face. Let's take a, a bath. Let's get ready. And then what would you like for dinner? Would you like some peas? We're going to have peas. How about carrots? So we're talking to our child and engaging our child in an interactive conversation. This is how we build that associative mass. And this is how we build IQ. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Gail Gross, for writing this amazing book and for touching our hearts, opening our minds, and inspiring our lives, those of us who are parents and those who love children, and changing the lives of children because of your beautiful book, How to Build Your Baby's Brain, A Parent's Guide to Using New Gene Science to Raise a Smart, Secure, and Successful Child. Thank you so much. Thank you. And on behalf of the Nautilus Book Awards team, thank you all. Mm -hmm.